I was working early one morning on a Wednesday. At that time, I'd been a police officer for a little over ten years. I was in a good mood that morning because I was expecting some potentially good news about an upcoming promotion. In fact, everyone was in a good mood that morning. I was eager to do my job and go home to my family. My day changed dramatically when the phone rang, though. It was an old friend of mine, and she had called me directly. She sounded exhausted and a little incoherent. When I asked her what was going on, she explained that she hadn't been sleeping. We'll call her Megan for this story. Megan told me that she'd been waking up every night from sounds coming from the basement of her house. At first she assumed it was rats or skunks or something. But then she said the previous night, the noises had gotten so loud that she was certain there was a person sleeping in her basement. Reports like that are never good to hear. It's a surprisingly common event where vagrants will break into someone's basement and live there for weeks on end, stealing from them and causing all kinds of damage. The real danger is if someone gains access to the main house. Megan lived alone at the time, so I immediately agreed to come over and take a look. I wanted to make sure that whatever was happening in her basement would come to an end. She asked me to come later as she was going to work. It sounds odd, but she wanted me to hear what she was hearing. She said that the sounds never happened in the daytime, so if I came over at night, then perhaps I could catch the person, if it even was a person that was living in her basement. I agreed, but it left me feeling uneasy and concerned all day. That evening, she let me know when she was on her way home, and I went to meet her at her house. She offered to cook me dinner while we waited for the sounds to start back up. I was in an even better mood, as I had learned by that point that I'd gotten the promotion that I was after. So we had a little celebration. At around 10.30, I heard the first sound coming from downstairs. She stopped and told me to press my ear to the door. So I did. I could hear a fair amount of shuffling. It wasn't very clear what it was, but it was definitely too big to be a rat or a skunk. I told her that I was going to slowly open the door. But when I did, it made a loud sound that I could hear crashing in the basement. I ran down the stairs with my weapon drawn, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I switched the light on. What I found was what looked like a large nest of some kind. There were branches and feathers and dried leaves all piled together in the center of the room, and it stank like nothing I'd ever smelled before. The window was broken, so whoever it was had left. I told her to stay at my house for a few nights and then arranged for some trail cams to be put up in the basement so that we could catch whoever was down there and have sufficient evidence. After a few days, I went to retrieve the trail cams and watch the footage. Megan was sitting next to me at the time. What I saw completely blew my mind. A large animal with long, thin arms and legs climbed in through the window. It behaved similar to a large ape, only I'd never seen an ape like that before. It brought with it more items to add to the nest. I know for a fact that apes don't make nests. In fact, most animals of that size don't make nests. It walked on its two hind legs like a human, but was hunched over the entire time. It had a large rib cage and large ape-like hands, but I remember noting that it had no ears and seemed to have no color on its skin. Apart from one large black spot on the back of its head, Megan was freaking out and asking me what to do. I had no answer, for I'd never encountered anything like that before. So I gave the footage to my superior. When he watched it, his eyes stretched wide. The next thing I knew, I had a non-disclosure agreement on my desk, and the footage was confiscated from my possession. Megan was also forced to sign so that she couldn't speak of it. She said that men with suits had come into her basement, and when they were done, there was nothing left and her entire basement had been boarded up. She never really felt safe in her home, though, and wound up selling it a few months later. It was a sad day, as that home had been in her family for generations, but whatever security she once felt there had been stripped away by whatever creature had decided to nest there. I was a ranger in St. Louis County, Minnesota. The year was 2007. A man in our staff went missing during his lunch break. He was a husband and father. We sent a search party out to locate him. 
We searched the area for about a day or so, but he was nowhere to be found. We even made inquiries to other nearby towns, but they had no information. We assumed he had wandered away from the area and may have perished. The family of this man requested his remains be found and buried. We honored this request. We had several months go by, and we put this man behind us. Then a strange occurrence happened one early evening in the fall. I was out on patrol, running radar on the roads. I was about two miles north of town, which is a rural area. I was doing my rounds, and I spotted a pair of eyes in the ditch. I thought it was a fox or something. I stopped my vehicle, stepped out. I wasn't expecting what I saw next. A dark, shadowy figure became now visible. It was hunched over, finishing off a deer. This deer was a simple four-point buck. The thing had just been killed and was eating it. That's not all. I was shocked at what followed. It stood back up, this thing on two legs, walking upright. It looked me in the eyes and quickly disappeared. The eyes were blood red. I watched this thing walk off into a nearby creek and disappeared immediately. I went back to the office and called my boss and told him when I saw him. He told me to stay there until he could get there. So I sat there staying in the office while my boss and another ranger wrote down everything they could about what I had to say. They searched for a few hours but could not find anything. I was scared to go out on patrol the next few days. It only happened one or two more times after this, and even then, that's probably too much. I ended up seeing it again in the area where I first saw it. It never acted aggressive, but it was always in that area. The final time it was winter and there was about 12 inches of snow on the ground. I saw it again. This was the last time. I was relieved when the spring came and I did not have to patrol that section any longer. Now, before I end my story, let me quickly tell you why I included the first part about the man missing after lunch. I believe that his spirit became disembodied and turned into this horrible, ghastly apparition that I saw, or otherwise known as a Wendigo. I believe that it's possible that his spirit, or him dying, turned into this creature that I saw. Of course, this is just a wild theory, but I cling to it because it makes sense to me. I would love to hear any comments or thoughts or even theories on what they think. Do you believe that he turned into a Wendigo? Is it possible that he died and his spirit was able to manifest as this being? I don't know. I worked as a police officer in the town of Nakagoshi's for around eight years. I loved it there. A lot of people don't see why I enjoyed it so much, but that town had really brought me peace after many rough years. That peace was completely disrupted one day, though. There are many trails in Nakagoshi's. Most of them are completely tucked away in thick trees and brush. It was my day off, and walking those trails was one of my favorite things to do. At the time I had been divorced, I'm ashamed to admit that I wasn't a very good father in those years. I hadn't seen my children in years, and I had made very little effort to be part of their lives. It's a terrible thing to admit to, and I have many regrets, but that's the kind of man I was at the time. I had picked out my trail for the day. It was one that I hadn't walked yet, and I decided I'd go exploring. For some reason that day my children were on my mind, I remember that it bothered me because it made me feel guilty. It was kind of a bummer to feel that guilt on my day off. In hindsight, I was probably thinking about them because some part of me knew that I was in imminent danger. The first thing I noticed was that the trail was very quiet, seemed unusual. Normally I'd come across at least one other person while on my walks. That day, I hadn't seen a single other soul. It didn't bother me too much, but it did tell me that I needed to be more vigilant for snakes and other dangerous creatures. I had stopped for a drink of water, and I was leaning against the wooden rail that lined the trail, when all of a sudden the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I hate that feeling so much. I don't really know why it happens to us, but it's never a good sign. I lowered my water bottle and listened carefully for any kinds of sound. I couldn't hear anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly the space around me felt way too quiet. 
I looked toward the direction I was going as I contemplated whether or not I should carry on with the trail or head back towards my car. I made the logical decision to head back towards my car. It wasn't far along the trail, so I knew it wouldn't take long to get to safety. As I walked, the only sound I could hear was the sound of my own footsteps, and it completely unsettled me. Then, something stopped me dead in my tracks. It was a light thudding sound, and it was coming from high up in the trees. I stopped to look. I scanned the trees, but heard and saw nothing. I decided to stay where I was for just a moment and listen. Then I heard the thought again, just to my left. It was as if something had landed in the tree. I looked up at the tree, which was covered in red and orange leaves. I focused hard on the leaves, searching for a large bird or maybe a squirrel. Then slow movement caught my eye. Something massive was stalking me. I couldn't see it clearly, but it had long limbs and it climbed through the branches sideways. It seemed to be keeping me in its sights as it moved gently through the leaves, barely rustling the branches. Then I saw part of its face. Two saucer-like eyes stared at me from between the branches. It seemed like minutes that we stared at each other. Not once did the creature blink. It seemed to be patiently waiting for me to look away. I was frozen with fear. I could hear nothing but the sound of my heart beating in my chest. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, more hikers stumbled upon me. They were noisier than I was. They had a Bluetooth speaker that was pumping loud hip-hop music, and they were laughing and joking. It scared the creature away. It took off along the trees, moving faster than any animal I'd seen before. Those other hikers will never know that their obnoxious behavior had saved my life that day. All I remember thinking was that I was going to die without ever seeing my children grow up. As soon as I got back to my car, I phoned my kids. That experience changed my life for the better. Still, I never want to be that scared again. It was a typical morning in Yellowstone National Park when the body of park ranger John was found. He had been on patrol the night before, but never returned to his post. The other rangers searched for him and eventually found him in a remote area of the park. But something was off. John's skull was missing, and his body had been brutally attacked. My name is Jack, and I'm one of the park rangers. I was tasked with analyzing the body and trying to figure out what could have caused such a gruesome death. As I examined the wounds, I couldn't help but think that they looked like they had been made by a large, sharp claw. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was the work of a creature similar to Bigfoot. I shared my findings with the rest of the park rangers, but they mocked me and said I was just seeing things. They reported the case as a murder to the police, but they said they were too busy to investigate. I was left alone with a body, and I knew I had to find out the truth. I decided to take matters into my own hands and ventured into the woods. I wanted to see if I could find any clues or evidence that would support my theory. As I walked deeper into the forest, I heard a loud roar in the distance. I froze in place, unsure of what to do. But then I saw it. A creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was covered in fur, had a large, sharp claw, and stood at least eight feet tall. The creature roared again, and a buck ran past me, panicked. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like something out of a nightmare. The creature then fled into the woods, and I was left standing there, in shock. I knew I had to tell the others what I had seen, but I didn't know if they would believe me. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I eventually made it back to the ranger station, and I told them everything. But they still didn't believe me. They thought I was just seeing things, or that I was losing my mind. I was left feeling alone and isolated. I knew there was a creature out there that had killed John, and I was the only one who knew about it. I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there watching me. I knew I had to be careful, and I couldn't let my guard down. I was determined to find the truth and bring justice for John, but I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that followed me knowing that I was the only one who knew the true horror that lurked in the woods of Yellowstone National Park.
I'm a Coast Guard. Old Navy tug brought into service to the USDS Creeker had a ghost of a Navy guy who died in the bilge from gas. Fast forward to a new used mechanic trying to fix one of the batteries and wasn't getting it quite right. A guy on the batter next to him said, No, you do it like this, and unscrewed apart, showing him how it was done. However, the other guy was in a Navy uniform, and we were at sea. He diapered shortly after talking. Lots of us had seen that Navy engineer in the past, but that particular coast I got off the boat at the next port call and refused to reboard. We left without him, not sure or whatever happened, but he never came back to the ship. We also had the screams of a lady that would happen during late shifts, enough that we always turned the boats aft away from the direction of the screams in case it was a civilian in the water. No woman aboard this ship. We would light up that section of ocean with high-powered lighting, but there was never anything there. We were told not to log the events. One time we paddled into a backcountry site that we like camping at in the fall. It's high on a rocky cliff, but has natural stairs up, so it's nicely protected from the wind and damp of the lake. One day we were walking around in the woods behind the site just to see what we see. There are lots of open spaces caused by exposed rock that create a natural trail. We weren't even that far from the site. All of a sudden we hear a short, low growl. We freeze. Neither of us were sure we actually heard it. We wait a minute, see and hear nothing, so we start walking again. A longer growl. Now the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. My instinct is to run, but I don't want to activate some animal's prey drive. We still don't see anything. My husband picks up a big stick and starts hitting trees and making lots of noise so we seem big. We slowly back away and walk calmly back to our campsite. Needless to say, we didn't sleep much that night. We never saw what it was, but our theory is that it was a coyote. We often hear them howling and yipping near there, and I've read they sleep in the open during the day. We pull into a state park campground to camp for a couple of nights. There was a line of trees separating our campsite from our neighbors, and our neighbors had a strap strung up between two of the trees with two blackened sausages hanging from hooks. Trying to ignore how weird that is, our neighbors greet us and say, Don't worry about the sausages. Our buddy got a trail camera, so we're trying to catch raccoons with it. Glossing over the fact that this trail cam was pointed right into our campsite. I had definitely had to keep this in mind when I got out of my camper to pee in the middle of the night. The sausages were still there the next morning, but I think eventually a ranger came by and told them to cut it out because they disappeared sometime during the day. I didn't like the weird vibes emanating from that spot, so we just ignored their presence for the most part. They were gone for most of the day, but came back to their enormous RV and generator right as we were thinking it would be peacefully quiet for the rest of the evening. The last morning... I wake up to the sound of a thousand crows circling us. I lay there for a while and then peek out and see a dead crow lying right in the same precise spot below where those black sausages had been hanging the day before. Every crow within a 100-mile radius was circling overhead, angrily cawing out during this crow funeral. Now, I've been on the wrong side of a crow war before, so I wasn't too interested in any of them recognizing me. We packed up our camp as quickly as we could and hit the road. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my, at that time, boyfriend's house, which took roughly 15 minutes, so let's say about 10. 
45 at night. I was full of energy at this age and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with a warm summer nighttime breeze. Car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its jerk cops. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat so I could really speed. And that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I'd take a right turn that was more than 90 degrees, almost back the way I had came. Then, in exactly half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel than it would be a waste, as I would have to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where all this went down. A house had recently been built there. Two stories within detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected as we built our family house, and it took us a year to finish it. I will start at the beginning because I believe this is all related. Week one. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along, when my lights illuminate something stunning sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf, a real wolf, a solid white real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and have even met a one-slash-fourth wolf in person. They looked different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it, and I, I notice that it's not minding me at all. It is sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking, its ears didn't even flick towards me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to be behaving like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Indian stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I got to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week two. I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolfy buddy, hoping to see him again around that area, so I drove extra slow with my window down and radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. Then I saw the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity. My reality and possibility of eldritch terrors, as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox, its limbs folded and pulled in tight with its hunched posture, yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor-sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated with barely more than frog-like thin skin pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright, and at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulked to them and looked equipped for running with back-facing knees for sprinting and tipped in raptor like curved claws, it looked tall, maybe seven foot, maybe more, just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes, solid black and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. Then I realized 
It's going to look at me. It's going to see me. And there is no avoiding it. Panic, terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world I had always known and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up or I'd be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car, and I would become an unsolved mystery. I had a manual crank window. F me, I had a crank window because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But now I realize that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning towards me, and I had let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I had to get my window up first, and I was cranking it as hard as I could. I was starting to cry as I finally got the window closed, and then I put my gas pedal to the floor. Gravel road be damned. I thought I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I've already seen too much. My tires had found grip, and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs, and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed. I'm really screwed. I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick I've mentioned in one of my other stories to tap my brake soft enough the light comes on, but I don't actually slow down. Red lit up the dust that was billing up in my wake, but amidst the swirling chaos I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest. I had enough and decided I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 100 nanimph, which is as fast as I can go, before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a right onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, no one was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time, so I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain. He was dismissive and thought I was pulling a joke on him. Then he thought I was just being crazy and seeing things. There's many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week three. I refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have to leave my boyfriend's house a bit early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days we went to a park to walk around, and on the way back, he decided he wanted to drive by the house where I saw that thing. I was hysterical begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded, so as we got closer and I could not stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic of getting near the place. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night in my mind again. At one point he stopped the car. Spooky, you have to see this, he said. Noah whined, resisting him, pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted to get out of here. While I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, furniture, power wiring, or even interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnout houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. 
I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten, my skin crawl, and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it, a thing that is nothing like any creature known to humans, yet still I saw it. If you've heard of something that matches its description, let me know. So when I was in high school, my friends and I were into really spooky shit that we had no business messing around with. We would visit cemeteries at night, go to our small town's local haunt spot, to try to stir up any urban legends. But the story I'm about to tell made us quit cold turkey trying to seek out the paranormal. One night, we were over at our friend's century-old home. I mean, it was old and creaky and the perfect setting for a night of Oija. We brought it out, and for the first half hour, nothing insane happened. Just some movement from the planchette. Then, feeling smug, I asked the spirits what my middle name was. The thing is, my middle name is literally made up by my parents. It's not a real name. No one in the circle knew, let alone could spell my middle name. There was literally no way someone could even guess it. But the board knew. It spelled my middle name perfectly, and I could feel my heart fall into my gut. Keep in mind, my hands were not on the planchette, so I couldn't have moved it myself. Everyone laughed, because what a silly middle name that would be. But I had to confess that it was mine, and the color drained from everyone's face. All of a sudden, a glass ashtray that was sitting a few feet away on the coffee table split clean in two, and we were done. We left the house to go stay somewhere else. I walk outside. It's the kind of dark when it's too early for morning still, but too late for night and it's freakishly quiet outside. I thought nothing of it at the time. Our trash cans were located on the side of the house in the backyard, halfway to the gate. If you stood at the side of my house looking towards the gate, you would see a hedge to the left of the gate that goes up to your waist. Across the street is another house with a driveway light installed. The light gives off that blaring white security light. Anyway, I get to the trash can to throw away the junk. When I look over towards the gate, that's when I saw it, whatever it was. I could only see the outline of it because the blaring white security light was in my eyes but it was the most smooth and round head I've seen, which connected to very slouched shoulders. At first I didn't know what I was looking at, just an odd shape, the same height of the hedges. It wasn't until it moved silently and slowly towards the bottom of the hedge and to the neighbor's yard that I saw it looked headish. I was fourteen at the time and just stood there waiting for more movement or sound. After about one minute, yeah, I waited. Of not hearing anything, I sprint back towards the kitchen door. I don't know what it was or why it moved so silently, but it wasn't much longer before we moved out of that house due to strange things. But that's a story for another time, or at least another post. So to start off, I grew up on a small farm surrounded by forest. It's a small town below a major city in Appalachia. The first incident with this entity was probably when I was maybe 8, 10, so 10, 13 years ago. I was in my bedroom at home listening to music and playing. My window was open and it was evening getting dark, but I could still see outside. I noticed my dad walking by the window stone-faced. I was going to say hello to him, but decided not to. Later, I mentioned to my mom that I saw Dad pass my window. She informs me that my dad wasn't home. In any way, my window was too high up for my dad to have been at that height. Mom decides it was probably a bear. We had a lot of hunting dogs that very often would freak out over nothing, but at the time of seeing what I thought was my dad, they weren't upset. I've mentioned this to my significant other before, and my friends and I were talking about our strangest moments, and significant other tells me to tell them that story, but then tells me he saw something similar when we were visiting my dad in his peripherals. He said it looked like a very tall person, but didn't see specific details, but that it walked past the large kitchen window. He meant to tell me earlier, but 
honestly forgot. It's really weird, and I'm not sure what else to think about it. But since my significant other told me he saw it, too, I've been trying to research what it might be. I've also just felt creeped out at the thought of going to my dad's again. I've had other weird experiences that I'm not sure what to think of, such as going hiking and finding small shacks in the middle of the woods that are my dad's property, then not finding them again, and my mother calling me from outside while I was playing and telling me she heard screaming, thinking it was me and couldn't see me in the yard and thought a wild animal could have grabbed me. Not sure if they're related, but figured I'd add that. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.